Hello and welcome to the Switch It Show on ESPNCrickInfo.com. I'm Jonathan Harris-Bass. As those of you watching on Google Hangout can now see, I'm joined on the show by Nasher, J-Rod and Vish for a show that will begin in international waters just hours ahead of the naming of the Australian Ashes squad and then paddle a little further inland along the familiar tributaries of England and Wales's green and pleasant land. So let us start with some pre-Ashes chatter and the latest from Australia. And we'll start with Shane Watson's decision to stand down as vice-captain. Do you think this was a case of jumping before being shoved, Jared? Uh, well, it's, I would have said that yesterday, but uh, it's interesting that last night Brad Hogg was on the IPL and he was talking to, you know, the, those little interviews where, where nothing ever happens on the IPL, and Brad Hogg said that uh, he lost the captaincy, and maybe he just said the wrong word, or uh, maybe something else was going on, but uh, essentially, I, I'd say he either was about to be pushed, was suggested he stepped down, or was just afraid he wasn't going to get the vice captaincy anyway, but we may, we may not know for a little while what the final final story was but uh, it's look it's a good move for Australian cricket because he was not the man you want as vice captain not the man you want as vice captain but it does pose plenty of questions of where it leaves him in the squad as well now because I mean uh, Vish do you think he's an automatic pick for the first test at Trent Bridge for Australia um personally I think he should be I mean He's someone who comes under a lot of stick. Um, when you say that, do you mean because you're English and you <laughs> want Australia to fail, or do you mean from a you know a global sense? I think, I think in a global sense, from a global uh, sense, you kind of need him to play. He is, he's clearly a very talented player, and you know you, you can point to his stats and the fact that he doesn't convert any, barely any of his starts. But he, uh, you know, he's clearly someone who, who can be a game changer. I don't know if that's a word you can throw out at anyone who happens to have scored a quick 50 or even a quick 100 as he did the other day. But he, um, personally, I can't see why he wouldn't be in that side. And maybe that's because they need batting, really, don't they? Maybe it is, as Jared points out, that it's because you're English. Because an average <laughs> of 24.11 in the past two years, and it's two and a half years since he scored a test match ton, um, does really pose questions about his, his long-term future. And, and Nasher, even more recently, he, he posed a question to himself when he got dropped from the third test in India about where his future lay in test match cricket. Yeah, I think it's an interesting debate that we're having over a guy who, like you say, has averaged under 25 in the last two years of test cricket and working out whether Australia still need him in the team. I mean, if you go back to the generation of Australian cricket that I grew up through, that Jared came up through as well and whatever, it was like people averaging under 45 wouldn't get a look in, in that team. That's the state that Australia's batting's in right now. Um, looking at the options they have, I agree with Vish. I think Australia need him in the team, partly because of the paucity of the other options uh, around at the moment. Um, he, I still think he has it in him to be a a good test batsman. Um, I don't think he's ever going to average in the in the mid 40s. But I I think if you look around state cricket in Australia, there's no one really screaming out to be selected ahead of him, which is quite a sad state of affairs for Australia's batting. Um, maybe not having this vice captaincy uh, around him. Clearly, him and Michael Clark don't see eye to eye on many things. Um, it's perhaps a way he can just be a batter in the team, um, and he can go out try and score some runs if he manages to get his bowling back. I noticed he bowled a couple of overs. In the IPL yesterday, um, including the last one that helped lose the game for his team. Um, but by the by, it happened to Luke Wright, an Englishman, the day before. So um, if he gets back to bowling, all well and good, but Australia have got to get him scoring. We, we, we say that. Scoring. That's what they have to get. <laughs> Literally scoring is the, the most important thing. I mean, the funny thing is that Nash is talking about this old generation of players, uh, you know, that all had to average over 45. The last time Australia had uh, a vice captain who wasn't very good, it was Jeff Marsh, and he was there because he was the ultimate team man. He's now coached all around the world. He's very intelligent. He does everything he can to push the team forward. You know, I mean, Pat Howard's comments might be ridiculed by some cricketers, but essentially, you know, I know a lot of cricketers behind closed doors that would say that Shane Watson doesn't add a lot to the team other than what he scores. Now, at the moment, he's scoring 24, and he's just been beefed around the park by, you know, Dwayne Bravo. His bowling's not quite back up to it. And it was, what, 15 minutes ago he said he didn't want to bowl again, ever? And now he's saying that he doesn't feel complete unless he bowls. Uh, you know, he's a contradiction wrapped in a, in a really bad wrapping paper. It's also a state, though, isn't it, the Australian batting, where actually, although Watson doesn't convert his 70s and 80s into 100s, actually 70s and 80s would be quite good for the Australian top order right now. So even if Watson only gets back up to that level, he's perhaps offering at least something to the top to the top order. And 
perhaps with his experience of Ashes cricket, he um, he may just come good during this home English summer if obviously he's he's in the squad when it arrives. Yeah, but let's take a look at at the new vice captain though, because we obviously don't know who it's going to be, but it seems likely that it could be going to Brad Haddon. Now, if it went to Brad Haddon, um, that's well, it's a marked change of stance, and it means that Matthew Wade's been moved down the pecking order as well. I mean, is that just a, is it going to be a very temporary measure? Do you think, Jared, if they bring in Haddon? Yeah, I mean, it can only be for the Ashes only, can't it? I mean, there's there's no there's no other reason you would bring him back. Uh, he, he's never truly succeeded at Ash, uh, at Test cricket. He's been handy. Um, I think Matthew Wade might have already made as many hundreds as had never made. Matthew Wedge probably met, played as many match-winning innings as as um, as had never did. So I think you're in a you're in a position where they're basically saying, "Look, we've got no one left." I know during when Australia beat India, uh, it was the first time I ever noticed how important Haddon had become to the team. Uh, he's a very personable person, and he's basically what what they would call what Ian Chappell's era would call the the after hours captain. Uh, he's the one that gets everyone to the pub. He's the one that picks the restaurant. He's the one that makes sure that the new player is involved. And when you've got someone like Michael Clark, who, let's be honest, for all of his strengths, probably being sociable uh, and including people in, is probably not one of them. Haddon is a perfect person to have around. And Wade's still quite young. Wade's not going to do that. And without without Ponting and Hussey, they've got no one else who can basically tap someone on the shoulder and go, let's go grab a beer. But what about the, the, the argument here that Australia need to start grooming the next captain to succeed Michael Clark? Because if that's the decision, then surely someone like Matthew Wade is the person that you should be looking towards. Well, I mean, they'd have to build a robot um, in order to find the next person. I mean, there's no one. Uh, you know, George Bailey and Cameron White. Uh, are about the same age. Uh, neither of them are probably at this stage up to test standard with the bat. Uh, George Bailey might prove me wrong if he gets picked in this squad, but I don't think he will. Uh, no, I think, um, I, I mean, what's the groom? Essentially, you know, uh, there, there's no one there. I mean, I, J, I, I promise you, JHB, there is no one there. I, if there was a list of short list of captains, I think me and Vish would be on that list. Well, yeah, that's what I think as well, yeah. Yeah, and uh, so, Jared, you mentioned there that uh, Haddon's the type of type of player that would uh, tap someone on the shoulder and ask them if they'd uh, like to come to the pub. How is he on boats? On on what? On boats. Wow. I mean, well, that's the sort of thing. <laughs> if you had Ponting and Haddon around for the whole, you know, end of Mike Hussey's career, things would have happened differently. It's a very interesting team dynamic at the moment. And if they do pick Brad Haddon, they're not picking him because they think he's a better player than Wade. They're picking him because they think we have no leadership left. Our vice captain's just been sent home. Uh, you know, we've got young players who, who are not putting in as much as they should. Phil Hughes and Usman Khawaja are not helping the team on or off the field as much as they should. I mean, the, there is no option. Um, there's no there's no grooming. There's no vice captains. There's no one. So to pick Brad Haddon, they're basically saying, we've run out. There's no one left. The only other person they could give this to is going to be Eddie Cowan. And anyone you look at that team, whether it's Eddie Cowan, Peter Siddle, um, I'm trying to think of someone else who's actually in the team. Team Nathan Lyon, yeah, Warner. <laughs> all these guys are actually two tests away from being dropped. Now, That's a worrying thing. Sorry, go on. No, no. I mean, you're right. That, that is the worrying thing. So I suppose what they're doing with Haddon is they go, well, if we bring him back, if he fails in two tests, we don't have to drop him. He's got a you know a career of experience behind him. Everyone else is a chance that they'll just get you know knocked on the head. So that's why we've got Haddon. And uh, you know, like I said, there is no one. No one. Ashton Agar might be playing in this squad. <laughs> I mean, they're literally just picking names out of hats now. Do, do you think that this goes along with um, Dan Bredig's articles, Ben, about the fact that they're going to be making the Cyril Washbrook analogy happen in this particular squad and they're going to go for someone who's, okay, not plus 40, but, but someone who's going to be drafted in for just a quick fix in, in, in the series? I mean, we're talking about Haddon doing that as a vice captain, but are there some other players who might get a chance? Well, I mean, uh, Brettig obviously talked about Chris Rogers um, and he talked about Ryan Harris. I think Ryan Harris is uh, probably still the best fast bowler in Australia. That's one area where Australia is doing really well. There's a lot of fast bowlers, but Ryan Harris uh, basically won the one-day championship for Queensland and he almost beat, won the uh, the Shield championship as well. So uh, he's a phenomenal player. He looks fit, he looks fast, and as always, he looks scary uh, on and off the field. Um, and so I think he's a big chance of playing. Obviously, they're going with Haddon. Chris Rogers is the one 
that would be the massive. Uh, I mean, that's not even picking Cyril. That's like picking uh, Bryce McGain now. Um, essentially, that that that's saying there's no one left. He's the only person we trust, even though we haven't trusted him his entire career. Suddenly, Chris Rogers is the answer. I don't think they'll go that far, but I think you're right. I think I think they will go Haddon and they will go Harris, and um, and partly that's because they are playing this series in front of them. They're not necessarily grooming for the future, but you know, there's not a lot to groom. At what, at what point are they going to start asking serious questions of the the drive and desire of these you know these batsmen specifically? I mean, you've got players like Kwaja who has been touted for big things for a while, and I'm, I mean, I'm a massive fan of the guy. You can just go on YouTube and find there's a beautiful Ryobi Cup innings he plays, um, and it's in HD as well. And Usman Kwaja deserves to be in HD. And it's, I mean, the the usually players sit on the sidelines of failing teams, and their stock go goes up simply by not really being a part of him. But he's someone who's seen, whose stock seems to have gone down, yet he's not been playing. It's happened to him twice as well. This is the second time that basically he's got to the fringe of playing for Australia and then somehow people have decided he's not very good anymore. I mean, his basic problem is he, a bit like George Bailey has always had, he doesn't make enough runs. Um, at this point in Australian history, you don't have to make enough runs. But as, as Nasha was saying before, if you really want to push for an Australian spot, you just have to do what Eddie Callender did. You just had to make a bunch of hundreds at the right time. And very few people are doing that. Usman hasn't done that. I mean, Phil Hughes is you know, very lucky to be going to this Ashes as well. Like, there's, there's a couple of young guys out there that, that aren't really doing anything, but it's because there's no one coming through. Uh, who do they pick? Do they pick, you know, Phil Hughes and Usman Khawaja, or do they pick Phil, uh, sorry, um, Chris Rogers and uh, George Bailey? They're the options that they have. They basically have, you know, very senior players who who haven't you know, haven't been looked at as good enough Test players before, or young players who potentially could be good enough in Test cricket. Uh, Usman Khawaja is very stylish, but you know, runs runs matter. I've heard they do matter, um, but he has scored them over here in county cricket. Phil Hughes has scored runs over here. Eddie Cowan scoring runs over here already this season. So, I mean, if you're proven in, in the conditions, surely it's worth taking a punt on them. We'll find out very, very soon. But let's shift our focus onto the domestic game. Uh, there are two sides who are exceedingly confident of victory at the moment in the top flight, but I'm going to pick out one of them in particular, which is Middlesex, who posted their second victorious result of the season in the second round of matches. The defending champions, Warwickshire, also chalked up their first win. Let's start at Lords, though, where perhaps the result flattered Middlesex after Derby had pushed their hosts all the way through the first six and a half sessions. Um, Vishy, did you see any of this one? Um, I didn't see much of it, to be honest, but uh, from doing the roundups, I uh, spoke to um, Alan Gardner, who was at the game, and even from the week before, you got, really got the impression that, um, I mean, Middlesex's bowling attack is ridiculous, really. I mean, Warwick has obviously won them the title last year, but... Um, if anything, the well, history has shown that you need to take, you need to convert those draws into wins, and Middlesex seem to have the attack to do that. I'm just, they Harris got um, a hamstring injury, apparently the first of his career, which is uh, interesting. And you know, they brought Stephen Finn in, which isn't too bad, really. I mean, Finn's obviously not going to be there for the whole summer. Harris will probably be there for the whole summer. Who knows what happened, what would happen to Roland Jones? I mean, to finish in innings with. A hat trick is pretty good going, and I mean the the guys up top, Rogers, as Jared mentioned, scoring runs, doing the business. Um, Robson as well, Robson, who's also eligible for Australia. So, I mean, you never know. We'll, have, yeah, they we'll have anyone. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, they. Uh, I mean, they're the form team at the moment. Obviously, they're not playing the next round, so people will catch up. But I mean, with Warwickshire drawing against Derbyshire, because of the weather and Middlesex beating Derbyshire, that's already. That's where, you know, Derbyshire at home, they might finish bottom, but that's already, one, uh, Middlesex essentially already won up on Warwickshire. So, um, no, it's been, uh, they're the team to beat. Definitely the team to beat. Um, Nasha, speaking afterwards, Gus Fraser talked about the fact that you don't win a championship in April, which is pretty obvious. Um, but he was purring about his attack, and he, he was obviously a member of that team that won back in 93, the last time Middlesex won the title. Um, so, I mean, they've started as well as they could do. They have. He's still not entirely happy, is he, Angus Fraser? It takes quite a lot for, for Gus to, to, to crack a smile, but he, he must have a sense of pride over how his bowling attack is working. Of course, when they won the title back in 93, it was an attack centred around 
twin spinners in John Embry and Phil Tufnell. So this is obviously a different dynamic that Middlesex um, are working to this time around. But I mean, uh, as Vichy was saying, they are almost the dream county attack in that you have three or four seamers that are interchangeable. So even if you lose a guy to injury like they have done, or you lose a guy to England like they will do, you've got another guy to slot in. The only question mark about their attack is if is if we get a, a warm, dry summer and pitches start to turn and perhaps seamers become slightly less effective, whether they have the spin options to really mount a challenge. Ollie Rayner is a workman-like spinner, but probably not much more. So that'll be interesting. But if they can keep if they can put runs on the board, a pace bowling attack of that skill will get wickets in whatever conditions and, and reverse swing will play a part if the summer becomes dry and warm as well. And people like Nasha, uh, How good is Toby Rowland-Jones? Uh, I've seen I've seen him maybe once or twice a couple of years ago, but he just seems a bit like Mark Davies. He just trips over wickets, but I, I don't know if that's, you know, he's just a county seamer who gets lucky or if he's really international class. I've always thought he's he's got the makings of an England bowler. He's got height. He bowls at that back of a length. Um, not not quick. He's, he's probably no more than kind of mid-80s, but um, dare I say sort of Glenn McGraw-esque in that sort of, mould that he hits that half of a length, moves off the seam, makes very good use of the slope at Lords, obviously is his home ground. Um, and I do know that a couple of England selectors have had an eye on him for the last two or three years. He has, um, a bit like Mark Davies' example you drew, I mean, he's ha- he has had a few injury problems over his career, but um, he-, he-, he strung together a good season last year. If he can string together even a good half a season this year, I think he'll be very close, especially uh, the way England are needing to build their pack of Pace bowlers, Graham Onions, his fortunes dip slightly in the winter, so it remains to be seen quite where he remains in the pack. And you've got Tim Bres, and we don't quite know how he's going to pull up from his latest elbow surgery. So if you have people like Roland Jones, you've got um, Chris Wright at Warwick, which is another one in the frame. I think you might see come the ashes, or certainly come the winter tours, that one or two of these bowlers uh, might well be in the frame. And I suspect Toby Roland Jones will, will play Test cricket for England in the next couple of years. That's really good because he once bowled me out in a charity game bowling spin, so I can say that I went out to a test cricketer. Well, you can, Jared. I'm sure it's not the only test cricketer that you've fallen to. Steve um, Elworthy bowled me last uh, two summers back as well. There you go. Uh, Chris Wright was the name I was going to pick up on um, in that match where Warwickshire were at home for the second week in succession, blessed with some better weather this time. They overcame Durham, 6 for 31 from Chris Wright, and it secured victory with 46 overs to spare. Um, as Nash has just mentioned there, Vichy, I mean, he does look like another one of these England bowlers in waiting. Yeah, he. Um, I remember the first time I saw him, it might have been a couple of years ago, and I remember thinking he was quite slight. And... Even even last season, he, he wasn't. He's not in the similar mould as these, uh, the likes of Tim Armels, anyone who spent any kind of time at the, uh, the at the academy or the England performance squads. They seem to be, you know, put them in grow bags, grow bags over the winter, and they come back looking like boxers. But um, Wright definitely looks a lot bigger this year. There's certainly which is which I can pick up that theme if you want because it's it's a valid point he's making that the bowlers that spend time um, at Loughborough do come out, bolt up, they spend a winter on fitness. But I don't think there's a there's an identikit formula for, for fastballs. Chris Wright as well is slightly more advanced in his, his career. He's, he's obviously been to a few counties before he's found this home at Warwickshire. Um, he's, he's an interesting one. He's sort of kind of almost come out of nowhere in the last 12 months, hasn't he, since he helped Warwickshire to the, to the title last year. He went on the Lions tour and he admitted it was interesting when he spoke to Alex Winter, who was at the game at Edgebaston last week. He, he was asked about his experiences on the Lions tour. Um, and said it was one where you had to keep your head up. Obviously, the England Lions had a pretty awful tour. I think they lost every game on that trip, um, and it showed up a few of the players, but but Chris Wright was using it as an experience. Well, look, I've, I've been out there, I've, I've sampled Australian conditions, and I know what it's about. And, mm. and sometimes in April, I'm not saying wickets come easily for fast bowlers, but they can come easily for fast bowlers <laughs> in April yeah. in England. So it's no bad thing for young quicks to have to go away and work really hard and even have some tough times overseas because as we just saw in the winter tour in New Zealand, um, wickets aren't easy, aren't easy to come by on some test pitches these yeah. days. So you don't want bowlers to be too flattered by their figures in April. Um, so I think those times when they've got to work hard are good and it will stand Chris Wright in, in good stead. I think he's the my good one, but he's a little bit further away. Uh, sorry, Nash. The, the bulking up thing I, I find interesting because if you look at England's fast bowlers, for instance, you've you've got you know Broad, uh, Finn, and Anderson. I suppose is the main three at the moment. Neither, none of the three of them are actually that bulky, and yet a lot of these guys coming through these academies now are coming up very very big. And if you look at people like Flintoff and Harris. I mean, I I'm just not sure that you need to be that big. Um, 
in order to bowl quick, and I think it can actually um, hold you back. So whether they're tr- what they're trying to do is get general strength into them in one summer and just actually you know improve their frame, and knowing that maybe they may break down or maybe they may not do as well, but in future years they'll be better off. Um, there must be a tactic there because there's no doubt that you see these kids come out of the. I mean, with that sky clip a couple of years ago. You- you could see the bowler go into the academy and come out of it on on the uh, on the documentary they made, and they were they were definitely a lot bigger at, at the end than they were at the beginning. And it is something that we're not we still don't quite know the physiology of bowling, as you said before, Nasha. You've got skinny bowlers who can bowl really quickly, and you know you know muscular bowlers who don't bowl very quickly. You know Tino Best and uh, uh, Stephen Finn are completely different body types, yet probably bowl similar pace. I think as well the um, the the key thing with that is they've clearly gone you know they'll come in waves now you'll see you know the likes of Tim R. Mills even I mean Meek is a big lad as well and he's not really that tall but I think it's more concentrating on their core because obviously that's where you have the issues with your lower back and things like that and if you have a strong core as you see with boxers as well the boxers who tend to last the longest are the ones with the strongest core um, someone like Hatton for example who uh, often would put on a lot of weight and lose a lot of weight he, that would actually be detrimental because his body, specifically uh, his center of gravity and his core, won't be used to carrying that kind of weight consistently. So the longer you have bowlers of that size bowling and going about their lives, you will see that they'll their bodies will become a lot more comfortable to the rigors of bowling quickly for a long period of time as well. I hope you say core more. Can we can we continue to talk about cores? <laughs> Well, I don't think we need to, but i tell you what we can talk about from that analogy is definitely that a diet of Guinness and Big Macs is probably, in the long run, not going to be very good for you, as Ricky Hatton has proved again and again. Um, Tim Ambrose back in the runs, which was good to see, um, and I know George isn't on the show, but I did think we should give a very quick mention to Ricky Clark's 92. There's no chocolate voice George the Bell going to pop out from behind you, Jared. Don't worry. He's not hiding your Robocop poster. Um, isn't, it, isn't it scary, though, that, like, you know, we find finally get a chance to go video and you know show how attractive we are and then you know the one sex kitten we have amongst us George Bell is not here I know but that's going to change so quickly and people who've been watching other podcasts and and, and hangouts on, on the site will have fortunately seen him and, and know that this is a show that they can tune into and not be totally blown away by the devastating um, handsomeness of, of, the, of the cast I, I speak of course I'm um, excluding myself there um, right <laughs> Let, let, let's move on because uh, Warwickshire play against Somerset and Taunton um, with the latter county coming into the match with the back of that draw at the Oval, which um, w- w- attracted so much attention. I think first match, Graham Smith in charge, first match of the, of the new Surrey breed, as it were, and, and the first match since, since the Tom Maynard inquiry. Um, just how much emotion was running through that game? And, and in the end, what do you feel this year was the final uh, outcome of it other than, obviously, it was a draw. But, I mean, Graham Smith seemed very upbeat. Yeah, he did. He did. Um, I went to the Surrey press day when he uh, gave his first press conference as um, Surrey captain. And, you know, I was impressed. I mean, it's hard not to be impressed by Graham Smith. He's a big guy. He's a lead from the front to have a captain. Good and <laughs> Very good core. Oh, I wanted to poke it. I didn't. <laughs> I should have done, though. Um, but he... Uh, he seems exactly the right type of person for Surrey. Surrey are lucky in the fact that they can afford someone like um, Smith to come in and lead that team. I think it does help that he wasn't there last year because of um, you know the top of the Tom Maynard tragedy and everything that's emanated from that. Um, on the pitch, he seemed to do uh, seemed to do all right. I know on the last day, people certain people were wondering um, about whether he should have been a bit more proactive. But I think you know their first game of the season, he led them quite well. He would have been disappointed with Mika. I know there was a lot of talk of um, why Mika got the nod ahead of Tremler. They assured, uh, sorry assured uh, everyone in the box, uh, the chocolate voice, George Bell as well, that he um, that Tremler was fit and merely they were just uh, picking Mika ahead of him, who did disappoint. Um, I know Dernbach bowled uh, very well. Uh, not very Dernbachian in that sense, but he, you know, he seemed to at least show a desire to want to bowl for um, for four days. Uh, I don't know, it's hard to say. I think they'll be there or thereabouts at the end of the season. I know that's quite easy to say because they've spent a bit of money, they've got a few uh, people in. Um, but and, and I do think Smith would be a very, very big part of that. Um, you know, like I said, it's hard not to be impressed by the man. Stephen Davis um, also managed to get some runs, Nash. A timely reminder from him before the start of this summer? 
timely reminder and just good for him as well. I mean, we talk about the impact of what last, of, that last year had on the club. He was one of the ones most severely impacted. Um, he, he's spoken, there's a, there's a piece on the site today, um, about how he, he, he did consider shelving cricket altogether um, and moving on. Um, and obviously it's been well publicised. His, his friendship with Elton John over the winter has helped him. He went on tour with Elton um, and, and he, he's come back. So did I. He did, yes, yes. Um, he um, he's come back and seems refreshed and revived. Um, look, I think he's a long way down the England pecking order of, of keepers. Now you've got Bairstow, Butler, you've got Keys Vetters, probably still in the mix. He's been named in the performance squad and things like that, so he's still in the selector's thoughts. Um, but I mean, it's just it's just great when a cricketer who's been through a tough time seems to come out the other side of it. And now it's just about him kicking on for the rest of this season, um, having a really good season, enjoying his cricket again, um, and then we'll see where he is come September, and maybe then we can start talking about him again as a, as a possible number two to, uh, to Matt Fire. Alviro Peterson's been signed by uh, Somerset, and at present, Jared, looks as though he could well be the sign, overseas signing of the, of the season. Yeah, it's also, I mean, I hope you can spell Somerset. I believe it was Alviro who uh, signed with uh, Glamorgan a couple of years back and then misspelt their name in, in his tweets for a little while. Uh, look, he's, he's an interesting player because he's very limited. I, I suppose he might even be, you know, similar to um, Eddie Cowan in that you look at him and you sort of think as a bowler, I reckon I, I can work this guy out and I think I'll be able to get him out. But there's something about him. He does fight his way through in innings and he's he's clearly good enough at test level to do that. So he would be a very handy player at uh, first class level and I could see him doing quite well. He's obviously already started well. Um, he, you know, I, I think it could be, it, it could, on Somerset wickets, he's not the sort of, you know, batsman I would like to bowl against because he sort of digs himself into a pitch and stays there for as long as he wants. And uh, in Somerset, that usually means a lot of runs. Well, he'll get a chance to try it out on the Taunton wicket when they take on Warwickshire in their next game. Surrey are against Sussex at home, which should give a fairly good early season indication about the title aspirations of both of those teams. Sussex, of course, as I will remind you on every show, Nash's pick for the title. And um, then we've got Durham against Yorkshire. Um, in the same way, Nash, that Gus Fraser said, look, you can't pick who's going to win the title in April. Nothing's decided. Is it too early to talk about Durham against Yorkshire being a, a potential, what, what would be termed in, in footballing parlance, six-pointer? Um, it's it's a little bit early. I think what is important for both these teams is to start getting their top uh, their top orders to fire. I mean, in their week off, Yorkshire had a, a three day friendly against Lancashire. There's ever such a thing as a friendly against Lancashire, um, and their top order was again in a bit of trouble until um, Bairstow hit a century, which is important for him, and, and Adil Rashid hit a hundred as well. Um, but you don't want your numbers five and six to have to continually bail you out. So, and that's a problem Durham are having. In, in, in an even greater way to Yorkshire. I mean, their game against Yorkshire, Ed Basson, that we've already spoken about, they were they were 30 for, for five or something like that, I think, in the, in the first innings, and they collapsed to, to 100 all out in the second. They needed 100 from Scott Borthwick, and a, a typically gutsy show from Paul Collingwood to at least give them something to, to aim at in that first inning. So as, as good a bowling attack as Durham have, um, you don't they can't can't be relying on likes of Onions and Mushworth and Thorpe to, to bail them out. So so they need runs from top order. They don't. Then, although I supported them staying up, perhaps in, in earlier shows, I think they could be in trouble come come later in the season. Fishy just noticed that we were about to start talking about the second division and, and disappeared. But he has actually. Sure, wasn't it? <laughs> when, oh, they're talking about northern cricket. They haven't mentioned London for about a minute and a half now. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to handle that. Uh, w one other game, I, I mean, what Nash just said was very interesting, but I was just thinking back to that Surrey-Sussex um, game. That will be interesting for the R Rory H. Brown, the other HB, um, as he's known uh, around ESPN circles. Uh, you know, him coming back to Surrey, I'm very interested in that. But are we going to talk about how bad Essex are? Because I'd like to apologise to all the Essex fans uh, for my performance uh, of recent times, and I, I will try and do better. Well, what, have you, what have you been doing so badly for Essex, Jared? Oh, it wasn't me. It was them, was it? But, you know, I mean, I could have supported them more, couldn't I? I mean, it's an amazing thing this early in the season for, you know, a coach to come out and basically say, yeah, we really were pants. We will try and be less pants in the future. But we want you to know we were that bad. It's weird. It was very, uh, it was very football manager -y, wasn't it? Yeah, definitely. It's quite... I mean, it's not unprecedented, is it? But it's rare that a 
county coaches will go mid-season. I think I, I, I think I remember it happening to Leicestershire a, a couple of years ago. But you've got to have decent money on Paul Grayson won't survive this season. I think because if, if certainly if things don't book up in the next couple of weeks, you, you notice on Twitter there's quite a there's a bit of a groundswell of a of a voice against him now. The supporters are getting a bit fed up in the fact that their championship form's been poor for so long. I think this was their They've only won 950 or something that Tim Wigmore, who was at the game for us, was saying. And there seems to be this obsession with one-day cricket, and, and which is fine up to a point if you can create a one-day dynasty like Gloucestershire did or something like or Leicestershire did. But Essex haven't even really shown that. They've had the odd glimpse, often powered through the likes of Gray Napier or something like that. But they've not really suggested forming a, a kind of a long-standing era of, of Essex success in one-day cricket. So I think the club needs to decide exactly what direction they're going to go. I mean, another point Tim made was they're producing a lot of talented young cricketers. We've spoken about Mills on this show already. You've got Ruth Hockney, you've got Tom Wesley. Um, you had Ben Folks, who is obviously now, um, who, who is now vying for Wikipedia's spot with James Foster. They had Adam Wheater, who has now moved to Essex. So they're producing talent. There just seems a bit of a, a roadblock about where that talent then goes once it hits the first team. So I think it's a really important few weeks coming up for Essex. Very important, and um, very important to remember that they were George's pick to win the second division <laughs> title. I just want to remind everyone about that. Um, but hugely important um, as well has been the, the performance of North Ants here. I think that because North Ants won this game so convincingly, lots of people are, are talking about how bad Essex were, including their own coach. But it's deflecting a little from the fact that North Ants were very good. Yes, uh, yeah, I mean, it was a fantastic performance from them. I mean, I, I certainly didn't expect them to be anywhere near promotion at the, at the start of the season, but uh, David Willey's in fantastic form. He's providing some balance to their team. Trent Copeland, who someone Jared will no doubt know a bit about, he, he looks another solid overseas signing. We talked about Alvira Peterson, whether he could be one of the signings of the season. I mean, Trent Copeland at the moment is only signed for the first, I think it's seven or eight championship games. They're already in discussions about maybe bringing him back for the latter part of the season. He's He's one of those players who, um, as long as he isn't named in the overnight Ashes squad, which we've talked about earlier, which is very unlikely, um, he's a real solid overseas signing. He's, he's well, checked. also with with Copeland, it, it, if you think about it, you really only need to sign him for about the first six or seven games, really, because he will do all of his damage at this time of the year. I mean, he's a guy who can swing it both ways, who can hit the scene whenever he wants to. He's very slow, but you know, in counting conditions, that's not always the worst thing. And, you know, he's a perfect signing. Steve McGoffin did the same thing at the start start of last year. Um, you know, it's, these sorts of players are very, very important in county cricket early in the season. If you're going to play all these games in April and May, uh, it's a very good time to have a tall international bowler for a few weeks, even if you can't get him for the entire season. And it's not, it's not going to be something terrible uh, with Bob Quine again, is it, where Essex have only called him up, so they didn't want to, they only called him up for the uh, April and May months, so that when, when batting gets a bit better, they'll invite Phil Hughes back, will they? Quine hey, will be fine. He can bat in any month, just not. <laughs> the other thing I was going to yeah, say about Trent Copeland as well—he's found himself at number eleven in Northampton, and he's got a, he's got first class hundreds to his name. And obviously, he put on a hundred and plenty with Stephen Crook and Northampton's last two wickets put on two hundred and twenty at six and over, and that's what got Paul Grayson particularly mad. So I mean, Northampton, while not having any, shall we say, standout individuals, they certainly have depth in that batting order, and you have people like Crook and. Copeland coming in lower down, so they're another top order that has not necessarily fired this season, but again, I suppose you can look at Warwickshire in the first division too, another uh, batting order where they're 7, 8, 9, 10 jack are, are quite powerful and could yet get them to some really competitive totals for the bowlers to work with. Northampton's play against Gloucestershire uh, next, um, Glamorgan have got the week off, but they managed to get their first win in Cardiff against Worcestershire for 42 years. Thanks to Jim Allenby, mostly. He was a stand-up performer with, with bat and ball. I mean, Does he qualify for Australia as well? Um, I, <laughs> I don't know. You're, you're, you're clutching at straws with some of these guys. I mean, you have people like Robson who genuinely does qualify for Australia. <laughs> I think so I'm might well. him. Yeah, I think Allenby does, doesn't he? Yeah, I'm pretty sure he's an Aussie. We'll claim anyone. <laughs> you, but you, you need them all. Um, but, I mean, I just wondered, I mean, was this a surprising result for you, Vish? Because at the start of the season, I think most people were just expecting Glamorgan to be hanging out the bottom. I think people think that of Glamorgan every season. I think Glamorgan could sign this happen side and they'd still be Glamorgan, you know. Um, uh, it's interesting, we, um, for all our cricket, we did a uh, massive Q&A with uh, quite a few captains and Mark Wallace was one of them and he genuinely seemed to think that they could you know cause a few 
cause people some trouble this year and maybe even be at the right side of the, the table and um, do some damage in the one-day game. I think... Vichy's gone into slow motion talking about, about this. <laughs> I, can, I, I can take off Vichy's point again because I was going to say, I think before we get overexcited about Glamorgan's result, we didn't <laughs> mention it was against Worcestershire, who are look really thin um, this year, uh, more so than other seasons, although it has to be said that Alan Richardson is still charging in and, and bowling a huge number of overs for even only the second week of the season. But I think before we get too much into judging quite where Glamorgan sit, we um, we do need to see them against perhaps some of the stronger um, Division 2 teams. Although one player who I think is worth keeping an eye on and one that Tim picked out in this County Colin this week is Mike Reed, the young fast bowler. He, um, I've not seen him bowl live yet, so I'm taking other people's word on this, but he, he's got some people excited about it. He's got height, he's got a bit of pace. Um, so I'll be interested to see how, how he core, develops uh, over, over the season. Is he got a good core? And I don't think he's Australian, Jared, so I'm afraid yeah. you can't have him. Now, we're okay for bowlers. It's just anyone who can hold a bat. I mean, Copeland might get picked as a batsman. He could be on number six. Yeah. That would be fantastic if a number 11 in the county game got, in the second division got picked as number six for the Australian well, starting about, it, it, about a month ago, two months back, we had uh, Glenn Maxwell, who was batting at number eight for Victoria, opening the batting for Australia. So, like I said, we'll take anyone, anyway, anyhow. So will we in this hangout, because uh, Vichy's back, um, and he's hopefully not going to be in slow motion now. But a final game to, to look at, and then with an eye on, on next week, because I know that uh, we've got Nasher, who's going to be going across to watch Lancashire against Kent, and Kent, who was struggled to be a team who were going to be pushing for promotion this season, have had a slow start to the season, because they've been held up, really, in both of their matches, and so they've drawn. So, I mean, an interesting one you're going to get to see them play here against Lancashire. Yeah, um, I quite like what's happened down at Kent since Jimmy Adams has taken charge. He's made some some, some shrewd recruitments. He's brought in some solid county cricketers on, on a tight budget. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how they go. I hope, hope, I hope Matt Coles gets the game. I'm interested to see him. He's had a, he had a difficult winter with the England Lions. He was, him and Ben Stokes, of course, were sent home um, after their issues they had um, in Australia. So it'll be interesting, interesting to see how he's pulling himself together. He was an England Lions cricketer this time last summer too when they played against... West Indies, so always good to see how players bounce back from this point. Of course, it's also James Anderson's first game of the season for Lancashire. Lancashire, so it'll be interesting to see how he sits back into uh, into competitive cricket. He's, he's got a couple of games minimum before the New Zealand series starts, so he'll be hoping for some fine weather so he, he can work through the gears ahead of the test series. So, next week's games, Gloucestershire, North Ants, Hampshire, Worcester and Lancashire against Kent. It's usually at this time of the show that I would ask everyone to give their predictions on those, but after last week's appalling selection, I'm just going to gloss over it completely. And so, all that remains for me to really to say is thank you very much to Nasha, to Jared and to Vichy. Until the next time, you've been watching the Switch Hit podcast, maybe even listening to it. I don't know which medium you chose today um, here on ESPNCrickInfo.com.